This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Clemence Pinel, a Wellcome Trust-sponsored PhD student in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and in the Division of Health and Social Care Research at King's College London. The topic we're going to talk about is ethnography of epigenetics. Let's begin by getting clear what epigenetics is. Epigenetics is the study of processes that influence the way genes are expressed and regulated. And epigenetics today has become quite a large field in uh, genetic science. And one of the selling points, in some ways, of epigenetics research is uh, the fact that now we can study with epigenetics the way environment can influence uh, genes and gene expression, and therefore the development of pathologies. So with epigenetics, some people say that we entered a post-genomic era. It's not just about genes that influence our health, but it's also about how the environment also has an impact on our health. And you've studied this as an ethnographer. You've, you've immersed yourself in the culture of epigenetic research. How did you go about that? So traditionally, ethnography has been done by anthropologists studying non-Western cultures. And uh, they've done this by immersing themselves in the culture they are interested in. So myself, I'm doing the same thing. I'm immersing myself in the epigenetic culture by becoming a member of a research team working on epigenetics. So I've uh, now been working in this particular epigenetic lab for uh, the past six months, and I've spent 200 hours in this lab just doing what the epigenetics research do, participating in their social life, in their work life, and uh, trying to become an epigenetic research researcher in some ways myself. But you're not a scientist, are you, in that sense? You haven't trained as a genetic researcher, so it must be quite strange entering that world. Definitely. I'm a sociologist by background, and I, I know really nothing about biology or genetics, as they do themselves. But it is quite strange because I'm also learning uh, a vocabulary, I'm learning about practices in the lab and uh, how they uh, develop their experiments, In some ways, I'm bringing my own perspective. I'm offering this sociological perspective uh, in trying to explore those social and political aspects that do influence science and the production of science. And you're not undercover here. You're completely open about being a sociologist, being an observer of what's going on. Everybody knows that I'm this strange sociologist in the team. I first met all the, the researchers in the team A few months ago when I presented my work, I was very clear about the methods I would be using and I explained what is ethnography, how would I collect my data. And we had lots of discussions actually about these methods and how at the end of the day I can come up with some results. And actually that was a really interesting discussion I had with with some of the epigenetics researchers. They were quite keen on understanding how from all this qualitative data I end up with a scientific result. Roughly how many people are in this laboratory? So there are about 30 researchers in this lab, but about 10 of them do uh, mostly uh, epigenetics research. Other researchers in this team do genetics research, but it's not strictly epigenetics. So it's a small enough group to build up a relationship of trust with. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I've become friends with some of them. With a few of them, I've really spent days working on one experiment together and I followed the life of a research project from the very beginning, building a hypothesis to uh, now they are uh, presenting at conferences their results. So following the life of the research cycle in some ways. Now I could imagine there are many different angles you could take on this as so much goes on within a laboratory. Are there particular areas you focus on? One of the things that I'm interested in is exploring the social and political context that influence science and the production of knowledge. So one of the things that I've noticed in the lab is that epigenetics is not just about revealing nature, but the scientists involved in epigenetics do a lot of work to construct epigenetic facts, to construct knowledge. So they collect data using specific technologies and they will pick certain methods to collect the data. They will also, as I say, play with the data with some statistical tools 
to analyze the data in the ways that they, they want to and reach a result that is positive and significant. And then they can actually show to the com research community, this is what I've found in my data. So all these small processes are really important in science. So th those technological aspects, but also some negotiation with other members in the team. So they are important uh, micro processes socially that take place around a research project. I'm not completely clear why that is constructing a picture of reality rather than picturing reality. Well, you could say that in some ways they picture the result they want to reach during the process of carrying out their research. If that was strictly true, though, would epigenetic interventions work? The key argument that I base my project on is that scientific facts are not just about nature or about technology, but it's about how the world is. Uh, it's about how, how it works socially and politically. Those contextual elements play a big role in how we see the world and how we, we construct it as scientific facts. Just to get clear, when you're talking about scientists constructing reality, you don't mean that their activities are just a fabrication that doesn't connect with the real world, do you? No, this is all about uh, how there are some contextual factors that can be political, that can be social or technological, that do influence the creation of science and the knowledge production. But obviously, a blood sample is a blood sample. This data cannot be created in any other way than from blood, from humans. So here, it's, it, my work is about underlying those social and political processes. As a sociologist, this is my job to uncover those elements and understand how scientists use technology to get to their results, how there are some processes of negotiations in a team, those social elements that do influence science, how the system of publications in uh, academia does influence the creation of certain findings and uh, encourage the publication of certain papers and not others. So these elements are the ones that I'm most interested in in, in my project. So people's expectations about what they're going to find colours the kind of tests and experimental setups they create. They have social pressures, publish or perish, that may actually make them more prone to publish a certain kind of research. And possibly, this is something a lot of people have talked about, that it's, it's heavily biased towards positive discoveries rather than negative results. There is a difficulty in publishing negative results and it's widely known. So obviously, one of the problems here is that people will replicate studies that have reached negative results, but they are not aware that others, other teams have ne reached those ne negative results before. So they will replicate those things because the scientific community doesn't accept publications with negative results. Yeah. Do you see, see that as a fault of the, the norms of science? Of today's science, probably yes, yeah. So your research isn't completely neutral observation. You're not simply describing the world you find, but you, like the researchers that you're watching, have particular sorts of frameworks you're imposing and particular sorts of results that you would like to find. Yeah, obviously I am coming from somewhere with some background and my discipline also imposes some theoretical background. So when I'm carrying out this ethnographic work, I try to be reflective about this and the way I take notes. And I so I also take notes about my own uh, feelings. I'm trying to separate what I observe from being really scientific observation of what I see in the lab to also more of my uh, personal judgments of what's happening here and how critically I can assess those things. So there's, a, there's two stages here, observation and then more about an interpretation of those things. And once you've got the observations and your own interpretations into a form where you can articulate them, do you play these back to the people you've observed? At the moment I'm not yet doing this, but the plan is to go back to the teams that I've spent so much time with and uh, present some sort of analysis, discuss this with them. And here, I, in some ways, this is a way of validating my results and reaching a, another level of interpretation and analysis. Interesting you say validating, because I could imagine you could give a very accurate, detailed description of the patterns of behaviour that you've observed as an outsider participating in this tribe's activities, and yet members of the tribe really wouldn't want to hear that description. That might 
happen. And from uh, previous experiences, when I did this before, I presented results for another project, some people actually didn't really like it, this discussion afterwards, because it didn't represent what they were doing in their own perspective. I saw it in, in a particular way and they saw it in another way. So how do you deal with that mismatch between your perception and theirs? I think it's just about discussing those perspectives and uh, coming to an agreement. I think this is just a matter of different disciplines and at the end of the day, we, I want to reach a conclusion that they are happy with because I'm, I'm really building this project together with them and uh, the, the expectation is that it will also contribute to their own way of carrying out science. I imagine the researchers that you're watching have a clear idea of what they're doing. They're presumably investigating environmental factors and the expression of genes, for instance. What is your justification of what you're doing? What are you doing when you go into that situation and record meticulously the interactions, the patterns of behaviour that you observe? The main focus of this project is to examine what we mean by environment in epigenetics. But this relates to larger debates in our societies today. There has been a strong focus uh, recently on how individuals can change their health by changing their own behaviours. So improving their health status by having a better diet or exercising more. So there's been this emphasis on individuals' responsibility for their own health by playing on these environmental factors. So this is one of the motivations here in the project is to see how in the field of epigenetics scientists interrogate the notion of environment and see how they conceptualize and how those two speak. So how can we inform the debate on responsibility of individuals for their own health and how can we think of a way where science can contribute to this debate but also social scientists can actually bring something uh, here as well. So, so far have you uncover patterns about the way that epigeneticists think about the environment? Is there something interesting that's been revealed about this? From my experience in the lab, I noticed that there are, let's say, standard environmental factors that are explored that are not actually specific to epigenetics research. And we hear them all the time. It's all about smoking, all about diet, uh, alcohol, you know, those factors that are here in, a, in our everyday life that we hear constantly as citizens, healthy people and not healthy people. So that's what I noticed that, you know, those, those factors are in the lab as much as they are in their everyday life. So there is uh, a merging of those scientific and non-scientific world. That idea of the, the scientific and the unscientific world could be problematic, couldn't it? Because surely the reason why diet and smoking and alcohol consumption are considered relevant factors by a lot of people is that the media have filtered through from scientific research findings which are maybe mangled but which are of relevance to people's everyday lives. There's a sense in which the media are trying to explain science to a wider public and then we change our behaviour accordingly. I think there's, there's two things here. There's First, we can consider why scientists choose to study what they study. So it can be because some things are easier to measure than others and get data on. But um, I think the other debate here is what those results that are disseminated to the public from the scientific world to the general public, um, how this dissemination is being done and also what does it mean for individuals who receive this information? Can I actually do something about their diet? Uh, Is it their responsibility to do something about it? Or should we, as a society, consider that actually it's everybody's job to improve our neighbor's health. So the way science is translated and motivated in the first place uh, is an interesting question. And, you know, then what do we do about it? You spent something like 200 hours, more than 200 hours in this laboratory. Now that you've had that experience, would you have done your research in a different way if you'd known what you know now? I think I would do even more. Uh, I might uh, want to do it in another lab, maybe in a lab with a slightly different focus. On a personal experience, I think those hours that I spent in this lab were extraordinary. I I learned so much and I uh, also created those relationships with the researchers that are really valuable. 
uh, not only friendship but also working relationship and creating those interdisciplinary links are really uh, interesting and I think that's how we can maybe think forward uh, in science. I think I, I would like to do it in, in another uh, lab and uh, pursue this question of environment uh, even further. Clémence Pinel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health in Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.